Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. I'm Ana Lucia Jacome, Senior Project Leader at the Division for People and Social Inclusion at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research UNITAR. I warmly welcome you all to the fourth event of the Virtual Roundtable Series, Mainstreaming Knowledge on Aging, an initiative co-sponsored by UNITAR and its CIFA Global Network, UNDESA, UNFPA, IOM, UN Women, UNHCR, WHO, OHCHR, ITU, the groups of, friend, of the state's friends of older persons in New York and Geneva, respectively, the International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse in PEA, the Global Alliance Inter, uh, International Longevity Center, the NGO Committee on Aging in Geneva, and the Global Initiative on Aging from The time event is motivation of older persons. This will be the opportunity to learn from the perspective of different, um, of different, sorry, my apologies, of different profiles. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. yes, no, 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 yes no, no. Our, our apologies. There was a problem with the with the with the technology. So this dialogue will be the opportunity to learn from the perspective of different profiles who will be sharing some of their good practices and challenges in the ground for the protection and participation of older persons, including through advocacy and concrete actions. Now. Um, we are honored to have with us experienced speakers who will be enlightening us from different angles. We hope you enjoy this enriching discussion. I invite now all the attendees of this event to send questions or comments by the Zoom chat. National human rights institutions have a special role to advocate and harmonize the needs of the population and effective response from states for protecting their rights. and promoting their participation. To introduce you, uh, Her Excellency Kei So Zing, Chair of uh, Chair Board Directors, Korea Center for United Nations Human Rights Policy, as well as member and vice chairperson of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Dr. Kei So Shin has been working in the area of human rights for more than 40 years in particular on women's human rights and on economic and social rights. During the 19th, she successfully led the legislative movements in Korea on sexual and domestic violence and advocated the issue of military sexual slavery internationally. She served as member of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, while also served as commissioner for the National Human Rights Commission of Korea. Being affiliated with national human rights uh, institutions national human rights for 15 years, is of the commission's work, including on the human rights of older persons. Excellency, we are grateful to, in spite of the times, which is in Korea, of course, you have the floor. Greetings from Seoul, Korea. Um, it is uh, near midnight here. Uh, and I think for some of you, it is uh, morning or afternoon. Um, and I'm very happy, although it is somewhat late of the day, uh, very happy to join you uh, to introduce the activities of the National Human Rights Commission of Korea. Uh, where I am affiliated as a member of the Advisory Committee on the Rights of Older Persons. Okay, um, next. Um, to just um, to show you uh, why the Korean National Human Rights Commission is very much interested in the issue of 
the rights of older persons. Um, in 2021, um, the proportion of um, the older persons is 16.5% of the whole population, which will be uh, estimated to grow uh, fast. And then uh, by 2060, uh, it will be um, a little less than half. So Korean society is very alert. Next, please. Uh, now, uh, the National uh, Human Rights Commission of Korea has been engaged uh, on this um, uh, activity to protect the rights of older persons in many ways. Um, in 2014, uh, ASEM, uh, which is Asia-Europe Meeting um, Summit, approved uh, the Korean National Human Rights Commission's projects uh, in promoting the rights of older persons. So after that, um, there have been many um, activities and efforts of the um, Commission. Um, in uh, 2015, the first um, ASEM International Conference on the Rights of Older Persons, uh, and then after that, uh, annually, uh, there has been conferences or expert uh, meetings. Next, please. Um, the most important thing for the commission is uh, policy recommendations to the government, as well as announcement of opinions. There have been uh, many recommendations on uh, all the persons' rights uh, who are living in rural areas, for example, high rate of suicide, um, the fact that uh, all the persons are being cared by all the persons themselves, and um, uh, how to deal with dementia, um, how to avoid uh, being um, hit by the traffic accident, etc. Uh, there have been also statements on every uh, day uh, for the older persons uh, on various issues. Um, next, please. Um, another important um, area of work is uh, researches and surveys to find out the real uh, life situation of the older persons. So for example, on the situation of poverty, how they are still working after retirement age, and then uh, the precarious working conditions. For example, uh, many um, older persons in Korea, um, uh, regardless of uh, whether they are um, men or uh, um, uh, women, um, they collect um, cardboard is or you know um, those uh, reusable things from the street, uh, which are very uh, um, dangerous sometimes. Uh, so um, these uh, fact finding researches and surveyed helped um, the commission and the society to realize what uh, the situation of those uh, people. And then um, there have been efforts to translate and um, uh, uh, publish uh, reference materials on all the persons. So um, all major documents uh, published by the UN uh, were translated and then made available to the uh, general public, including um, the reports of the Secretary General, independent expert, um, the current one, as well as the uh, previous one, uh, the the two very important reports uh, published by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, as well as the Inter-American Convention and many other, you know, um, uh, documents um, that are uh, published uh, that was translated, uh, which I supervised um, the translated version. Next, please. Um, there are also um, efforts to organize um, all the persons themselves to monitor the situation of um, the situation of all the persons. Um, uh, abusive situation. Uh, so the human rights defenders for all the persons was the name which uh, continued from 2009 to 2015. So uh, there were like um, six, seven years of uh, practice to monitor the situation. Uh, and then also in 2016, uh, there was um, approval from the ASEM summit uh, regarding the establishment of the ASEM Global Aging Center in Korea. 
So the center was established and uh, started to function uh, since uh, 2014. And then uh, this ASEM um, Global Aging Center um, do the policy research, exchange and cooperation, awareness raising and education, as well as uh, to provide information to the public. And then they also have forum on the rights of older persons and other activities. Next, please. Uh, now, the current work of the Commission is uh, preparation of the draft convention on the rights of older persons. Uh, of course, we know that uh, in New York, um, the states are discussing in its open-ended working group on, the, uh, on aging, uh, the possible uh, convention. And then uh, the Korean National Human Rights Convention, ha convention uh, Commission has already prepared a zero draft, which was finished um, uh, um, some two weeks ago, and that will be discussed at the International Conference next week, uh, which is scheduled 23rd um, uh, Wednesday. Uh, and uh, then after discussion, and then actually uh, Claudia Mahler is coming also, and then other um, international experts. And um, the uh, International Conference, uh, we, dis we will discuss uh, this zero draft, and then uh, it, it is uh, the Commission's plan to propose it to uh, Gandhi, uh, the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, and then uh, hopefully, um, uh, by, uh, if agreed, uh, that will be presented to the open-ended working group on aging early next year. Next. So, um, so this is all uh, that I am <laughs> uh, reporting uh, what have been the activities of the Korean National Human Rights Commission. And I'm, by, I'm very happy that I am a part of the um, commission uh, in, in many uh, uh, ways. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks to you, Madam Sheen. Uh, I uh, am Alex Mejia and I will serve as the, as the moderator from this point on. I want to thank you for that uh, very unique um, and uh, detailed update, and also to commend you for all the work of the organization that you lead. Thank you very much indeed. With that, uh, I uh, would like to uh, thank you, Ana Lucia. Uh, that's very good indeed. Uh, let me continue, if I may, with the, the next speaker for this panel by also mentioning how uh, much we appreciate the support of several strategic allies uh, to UNITAR and uh, to, to the whole ecosystem uh, seeking uh, to improve the situation of older persons around the world. And in that sense, I refer to Mr. Gerardo Cuartero, who is a director at Caixa Bank, um, assigned uh, with responsibilities over the South Oriental Andalusia region of Spain. Mr. Cuartero is a great supporter of this cause, and it is a great privilege to have him as one of the speakers today. So without further ado, uh, dear uh, Gerardo, uh, welcome, uh, bienvenido y muchas gracias. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, well, uh, greetings uh, to everybody for, from Malaga, Andalusia, Spain. Um, we are uh, honored to be here and thanks uh, to UNITAR for giving Kaizban the chance to explain uh, the, the, the special program that we have developed for our older people, our senior clients. May I start explaining who we are? Who, we are? who is Kaizban? Kaizban is uh, a Spanish bank leader in the domestic market. We were founded uh, 118 years ago, and since then, a considerable part of our profit goes back to society through the La Caixa Foundation, one of the most important capital foundations of the world, and at the same time, our main shareholder. We are not an ordinary bank because our aim is to offer banking services, but also improve people's lives and contribute to the well-being of society where we operate. You can see in the slide uh, the, the key figures of the Kaishaban group. Uh, well, mainly uh, Kaishaban is leader in Spain in number of branches and cash points. We have uh, uh, more than 20 million clients and uh, around uh, 44,500 uh, employees. And why do we have, uh, please next, why do we have a special program for our senior uh, clients? Okay, the reasons are the following. 
Currently in Spain, uh, we have almost 9 million people older than 65. In 2030, one third of the population will be at that age range. At TaxBank, our customers that are over 65 amount to more than 4 million. Due to a higher life expectancy and a better quality of life, at present, we have what we call a new senior generation. And it happens that the relationship with banks has changed drastically in recent years. The speed of the change has increased due to the digital era. And currently, people don't usually go to bank branches. And the majority of transactions are done through banking apps. As a result of that, many of our elders haven't been able to adapt to the rapid changes which have taken place. This has caused them to feel overly uncomfortable when interacting with their banks. And not only do they feel uncomfortable, but they also find that relationship very difficult and sometimes impossible. So what we did is ask them what they require from us. And the answer, uh, the requirements were having quick attention, attention, receiving personal service, confidence, trust, help and assistance for adapting to change, special services, which facilitates their lives, and transparency and simplicity in their relationship with their banks. Uh, next, please. In light uh, of this information, uh, we launched a new set of services in, 2000, uh, in 2022, focused on covering older people's needs with a new name, Kaisaban Seniors. Uh, next, please. So we brought a different offer to the market with the following main three characteristics. Uh, we have created a new specific role of employee focused on giving the best support and service to this group of clients, the senior advisor. Their skills will include being empathetic and they will create a new model of relationship based on trust and listening. A global ecosystem with, with financial advantages and services adapted to them and with a continuous support coming from the advisor whenever needed. Regarding positioning, Kaisaban seniors will be present in the main media as well as in the main social networks and opinion firms aimed at this segment of the population. Next, please. Therefore, in 2022, we uh, reinforce our commitment to care for our senior citizens with the most extensive uh, measures in the Spanish language sector, which uh, is our commitment with our senior clients. Our commitment uh, is giving them the best support, adapting ourselves to the way of relating to each other. And also we have a big commitment with uh, the financial inclusion. Just uh, let me remark that we have now more than 2,000 senior advisors specialized uh, in giving attention to our senior uh, clients. Next one, please, because I'm going to, to develop what it was there uh, in the following slides. What have we done? Uh, we created specific products for them. For example, the uh, My Boss Senior Protection uh, Service, which is this watch. It's a 24-hour service during 365 days in, in and away from home. It has, it is linked to a central unit with the following services, chat, telepharmacy, concierge, medical help, etc. And it has um, a, a major characteristic. It has a detection of when they fall uh, and they can uh, get help from, from the central unit. Also, uh, we help uh, people personally to learn how to use our digital equipment. We have preferential areas for them in uh, the major, uh, in most of our branches. We adapted our uh, ATMs to, to them, uh, make them uh, uh, easy to use. And we have a system of uh, a facial recognition, uh, which no needs uh, for a PIN number. Uh, next, please. We have a commitment uh, to always give them personal attention on the telephone and WhatsApp. Uh, no bots will interact with our senior uh, clients. We also created a special telephone line for our senior clients where all calls are attended. Next one, please. 
and the, they also can contact their advisor uh, by WhatsApp. Another thing that we did, uh, which was uh, uh, very highly required by our, by our clients, were, were, was extending the time in which uh, they can have access to a personal cashier, because some of them have uh, difficulties to interact with, uh, with the ATM. Uh, next one, please. And we work very hardly to avoid financial exclusion in two ways. One is uh, um, giving uh, training sessions, uh, financial uh, sessions to uh, education sessions to our elders. Uh, we try to train them uh, in um, to train them in financial autonomy, uh, teaching them uh, how to use uh, cash bank apps, WhatsApp, or special products. Not only financial, as you saw. Uh, uh, adapted to them. We are the first financial entity in Spain with face-to-face -face training sessions. And secondly, oh, could you please, okay, thank you. Uh, we work hard uh, to avoid financial exclusion in rural areas. We have the commitment of maintaining the branches in rural areas where we are the only uh, bank open. Just take into account uh, that uh, in the rural areas, the 80% of clients are older than 65. But not only that, we have also the commitment to uh, attend, to, to, to give uh, banking services in another 426 uh, municipalities with a service uh, given by uh, our one of our 17 buses, which uh, attend uh, all these uh, municipalities without uh, banking service. Uh, this is the end of my speech. Uh, may I um, just say uh, muchas gracias. Uh, thank you for your attention in Spanish. Uh, and thank you very much for the chance given. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you, uh, uh, Mr. Quartero. Uh, this was uh, uh, the whole idea that we hear about advocacy and also action. And uh, your bank is indeed uh, very much into the action part. Thank you for sharing uh, with us all these activities um, that you are doing to uh, show um, how important the older persons are for the bank. Very good. With that, uh, allow me to move uh, now to a very important video that we would like to present to all of you. Um, uh, this comes is a special message from Professor Michael Stein the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability. Uh, he's a visiting professor at Harvard Law School since the, the year 2005, and we are very uh, honored and pleased that he has taken the time to present this video. Ana Lucia, please. Thank you. Greetings colleagues, I'm Michael Stein from the Harvard Law School Project on Disability. I am very grateful to be able to join you today to share a few thoughts as part of this UNITAR session on sharing knowledge regarding aging, discrimination, and inclusion. I apologize for not being able to join you in person. I'm at a concurrent session on the rights of elders. I had the honor of working with His Excellency Ambassador Gallegos in the negotiation of the rights of persons with disabilities. Now the UN is considering and moving forward on drafting a similar human rights convention on behalf of persons who are older. The same rationale that moved forward the treaty on behalf of persons with disabilities, it seems to me, justifies moving forward with the treaty on behalf of elders. There is a vulnerable population. It has been marginalized and been made invisible. And the universal coverage and the universal protections inherent in the other human rights treaties have not done sufficient work in order to protect the fulfillment and enjoyment of the human rights of this group. We saw this in graphic detail regarding both elders and persons with disabilities during the COVID pandemic. Much like other marginalized populations, these groups were not considered part of the goal and part of the priority of states in responding to COVID. And we saw the results regarding mortality rates, uh, injuries, and long-term harms. 
But the marginalization and exclusion of elders and persons with disabilities exists at a much more subtle level and perhaps one that is less visible on a day to day basis food insecurity, lack of access to health care, inadequate standard of living, and lack of social inclusion across the board. These are some of the notions that precipitated the drafting of the CRPD, and I would argue should also precipitate the drafting of a human rights treaty related directly to aging. And this is despite the fact that if you live long enough, you are nearly certainly going to have some form of a disability, even if it is a mild one, such as loss of vision and hearing, or if it is a more dramatic one leading towards dementia and other kinds of conditions. So having a, dis having a disability specific treaty has enabled persons with disabilities and likewise having a treaty for the rights of older persons would likewise empower that group. One can easily see the justification on some apparent rights, such as employment, lifetime education, access to society, freedom of bodily integrity, and so on. But I'd like to raise two issues that I think were very important to the disability community during the CRPD that have equal relevance to the rights of persons who are elders, but yet aren't really considered very much at all. The first has to do with legal capacity. As we age, much like as we become disabled, persons are placed under guardianship, placed under other types of legal devices, whereby the opportunity to express their will and preference is limited. This is especially in the case of psychosocial disabilities on the one hand, and for example, for dementia, or what used to be called senility on the other hand, regarding those who are elders. And yet we know from the disability context, we know from other contexts, that capacity is like a muscle. If it's not used, it, it doesn't grow. And if it's neglected, it atrophies. Persons who are older are often have their rights taken away and placed within the remit of someone else. And we need to think about how to best enable elders as they age to be able to make decisions on their own behalf in a wide variety of circumstances and to understand that even with conditions such as dementia, there are some decisions with which some people are more adroit than others. And there are times in which their capacities will be stronger than at other times. And yet there is very little being done within the realm of supported decision-making, which is being pushed very strongly by the disability community within the realm of aging. It's an area we truly need to think about. Second area that is not very well considered, but which should be regarding the rights of elders, is independent living. Within the disability context, we have a 50-year movement around the globe in some places more culturally and resource appropriate than in others for persons with disabilities to live independently, to live within the community, to engage and decide where they're going to live and with whom. With elders, very frequently, they're placed into large congregate care, otherwise known as nursing homes or social care homes. And we saw with COVID what the result of that is. We have had a deinstitutionalization movement in the disability community since the 1970s and 80s. And we have yet to see a deinstitutionalization movement among elders and it's something we need to consider. Again, coming full circle, the lessons of COVID and what happens when you're abandoned in congregate care ought to be absolutely clear. Thank you for allowing me to share these few thoughts, and I look forward to working with you in the future and to supporting the efforts towards a human rights treaty on the rights of persons who are older. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Professor Stein uh, for that uh, video that we have uh, greatly enjoyed.
And uh, uh, we have uh, as well a message from Madame Frances West um, uh, about the contributions, um, uh, the importance of technologies in this uh, field. Uh, before we watch the video, I simply wanted to say that she's an international recognized uh, thought leader, keynote speaker, advisor, um, and uh, executive. Uh, known globally for her work in digital inclusion, emerging markets, and organizational transformation. Uh, she works with industry, government, startups, not for profits, and um, multilateral organizations, and has been uh, IBM's uh, first chief accessibility officer um, in the past. So we very much look forward to hearing uh, from her. And after that uh, video, I would like to open the floor for some uh, questions and answers with the um, honorable panelists uh, that are uh, joining us today. So Ana Lucia, the next video, please. Hello, this is Francis West, founder of Francis West & Co. And I'm calling in from Boston, Massachusetts today. I'm very honored to be invited to UNITAR's mainstreaming knowledge of aging roundtable. And as I sit here, I recall fondly about 16 years ago on the eve of December 3rd, 2006 of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, I was invited to speak on the topic of technology. And now 16 years later, as we discuss the human rights for older adults, again, it is a unbelievable a privilege that I am here to be able to talk to you about the importance of technology. I think nobody will argue that the importance of technology is here to stay, especially since the pandemic hit us three years ago, that we all had to learn a new way of connecting, and it's all through technology, such as Zoom, that we're using to talk to you today. And that technology is in our lives, impacting everything we do, and it affects how we live, how we work, how we play, and how we socialize. So it's not a nice to have, but a must have as a, uh, in our lives. And yet technology, leave it unattended, can create barrier and can do unintentional harm because of its speed and efficiencies. So example is that if you design, let's say a mobile application without thinking about font size or color contrast, and easily you know, navigation uh, kind of uh, uh, process, then people who are blind or low vision will have a problem using that. And artificial intelligence, on the other hand, potentially can create harm. And one example is that a lot of people use AI to, to recruit people, and it can accidentally filter out older adults for jobs and not recognizing the wisdom they bring to work. So as we envision a world which includes a new marketplace, workplace, and home place where older adults will be the majority, because based on demographic, we know that we are into or entering a world where there's more older adults than young people. So that means we have to shift our thinking as to what technology can do for us in this new uh, par paradigm shift. And first is that when I talk to the um, technology uh, advocates or um, uh, developers, I ask them not to think about older adults as them, but as about all of us, because there's one thing that we cannot avoid is aging. And therefore, we all will be on this curve of becoming older adults. Historically, when we build product, especially tech products, we build it for children, young people. We don't usually build it for older adults with the wrong assumption that older adults don't use technology or older adults don't like technology. But technology has evolved to a point that you can apply intuitive design or what I call the human first design to appeal to all populations. Apple iPhone is a great example where it's intuitive interface cut across all generations. So there is a huge opportunities for young entrepreneurs or startup to design first with older adults to get the maximum reach of marketplace. 
And second, today, a lot of technology that older adults use are for health and for care. And as the first wave of a technology application for older adults. But there is much more to that. There is nothing wrong with trying to use technology to address health and care issues. But with baby boomers here in the United States that holds $92 trillion net dollar net worth, they want to have fun and joy. So technology innovators has a huge marketplace to invent, for example, virtual reality gamification to address, you know, a fun issues and fun topic. And that is a huge opportunity for adult to have, you know, using technology to improve the quality of life. Last is that the technology innovators and understanding the wave is coming are beginning to come together working with advocacy groups to understand the user requirements, the user behaviors. And we're beginning to see that business are and also these advocacy is coming together and with across all industries like technology, financial services, and retail. So there is beginning to have a coordination of this kind of effort. If the UN Human Rights for Older Adults Initiative becomes a reality, it will create a great catalyst to accelerate this innovation wave and the momentum that already is starting to look at adult um, people who are older as a marketplace. If we can do that, then we can use a policy-driven growth initiative to uphold the promise of technology in a very positive way and create the desired outcome of good health, wealth, and happiness for all people. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic, and I wish you a very uh, successful continued discussion on the topic of older adults. Thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Madame West for um, that special message and for taking the time uh, to produce that video. Now, um, allow me to uh, go back to our speakers um, with a couple of questions that I think help us to explore a little uh, deeper uh, this issue. So we have uh, received from the floor a question from uh, several, but uh, we have selected one question to, for Madame Shin, if I may, Excellency. It uh, says, uh, thank you, I, it says as follows. Um, I would like to ask a question to Professor Henry Shin. Uh, there are many issues discussed around the right of all the persons, in particular with respect to economic, social, and cultural rights. One of the elements that requires, requires major attention is the protection of the rights of other people in rural areas. This is about rural areas. Uh, for example, on access and tenure of land. How can the United Nations and its bodies support the right of all the persons in guarantee, guaranteeing the right to land tenure and housing, particularly in rural areas? Quite a specific question, Madame Shin, but if you can give us your opinion, that would be very good. Thank you, Professor Shin. Um, thank you for the question. The current convention on economic, social, and cultural rights would help. Yes, no. How a new uh, convention indeed would help. Convention. No. Yeah. Um, well, um, actually, that's a tough question. <laughs> I <laughs> should say uh, because a new convention uh, still has to be seen. Um, we, we uh, as I introduced, uh, the Korean National Human Rights Commission has come up with a draft convention, which will be discussed uh, next week, and then we'll go through process, which deals with um, uh, the um, independence, uh, autonomy, um, uh, uh, rights of all the persons uh, to be free from uh, violence and abuse, uh, dignity, many things, yeah. Uh, and then uh, probably um, it will not deal with specifically about the rights of rural elderly uh, or the uh, older persons living in rural areas 
uh, in the land tenure, uh, which is more specific things. Maybe the new convention will not be able to deal with every details of uh, all um, those people um, uh, comprising, you know, those urban dwellers as well as as well as uh, rural dwellers. Uh, regarding um, all aspects of economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, including uh, the land tenure or uh, housing, etc. So, so we'll have to see. Um, if I can um, add something, um, the current, uh, as a current member of the UN uh, Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which also deal with all these issues of land tenure, right to housing, um, etc. Uh, there's always uh, room to improve because we very much try to address uh, all the issues of um, economic, social, and cultural rights, including of um, the older persons. Uh, but uh, because of time constraints, because of all overlap, it was not uh, we were we were not able to do that. So um, I would like to say that um, as a warning, even if we have a new convention on the rights of all the persons, uh, it will not solve every issue. It will have to see how the convention will address all the issues, it should be very uh, flexible. And then also there is um, uh, yeah. there is the problem of implementation. So the convention exists, co the convention might exist, but also implementation is another thing uh, mm -hmm. with all the uh, constraints that we have within the existing uh, human rights system. Um, yeah, um, and I'll stop here. And maybe if there is any further questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer um, answer them. Indeed, and I, and I thank you, Madam Sheen. Um, that's a very good answer uh, because it's very um, uh, honest and based on your experience. Uh, the convention will help, but there are still several other things that should happen after. Now uh, we have received a question to uh, from Mr. Quarteras, Quartero, excuse me. Uh, it says as follows, um, Gerardo, if I may. Um, uh, we commend um, the commitment of uh, Kaisha Bank, I'm, I'm translating actually, of Kaisha Bank uh, to focus on improving service uh, for all the persons. However, we wonder if the whole of the financial system uh, has actually made that commitment or is not the case yet. So the question, uh, Mr. Quartero, uh, with all our respect for, uh, for Kaisha Bank, uh, because uh, we see that you are really committed uh, to, to focus on improving service for, for the elderly. Uh, the question is, do you think the whole financial system has already done that, or there is still a long way to go? Do you? Okay. Um, uh, I have to say, may I say that uh, we have been the first ones in Spain to, to take uh, his, uh, these steps in order to um, to fill that gap that uh, is uh, being bigger uh, because of the digital area um, uh, era uh, at the speed of the digital era, uh, I, I I I don't know what the other banks are going to to, to do, not only in Spain but uh, in the rest of the world. But I suppose that uh, we don't have any other chance than uh, taking uh, that, that that all people take those steps. We have some difficulties because um, the steps that uh, we have uh, taken uh, go uh, a bit against the efficiency because if you if you contract more people uh, you 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 the cost of that you have to to measure it okay so it's not a, an easy an easy task uh, the the one that we have uh, ahead and uh, and uh, we have to 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 take care of the cost that all these measures uh, are having. But uh, as uh, I said at the beginning, uh, Kaiser Bank is a bank uh, which tries always to not only to give, to, to offer a banking service, but to think in the society where we operate. And uh, we don't have uh, any doubt that this is the correct, uh, uh, the, that we are taking the correct uh, steps and we will uh, keep on working on that direction. Thank you very much indeed. 
uh, we, we appreciate that uh, commitment and that our work um, of Kaiser Bank. Another question that we have received from Madame Shin, Shin, it comes from, it says, good morning from British Columbia. You can also see the questions, by the way, on the chat, but, all, but only the, um, the speakers. It says, good morning from British Columbia, Canada. It is nice to be invited. I need to know uh, what is being done around the nations of Africa on the issue of aging. So Madame Shin, uh, Madame Shin any comment that perhaps you will have on the, the very many regions that comprise the whole uh, spectrum of member states uh, that will be in need of uh, providing support for the adoption of, of a convention on the rights of other person. Without singling out particularly Africa, let me just ask you in general terms between the developed and the developing world, um, what comments will you give us on how ready they are the developed nations, are they ready to support a convention? Or the developing nations, are they ready to support a convention, if I may? Um, rather than um, whether um, um, developed countries would support or developing countries would support, um, I don't think there is any clear division um uh rather um which countries are uh, for example uh, let me put it this way for example um latin america uh in latin america there's already inter-american convention um under uh human rights of all the persons and then of course there are differences in terms of uh, some countries are more developed uh even in latin america and some countries are less developed so rather than um, there is a clear division between the developed countries and developing countries, I think um, it is uh, it depends on the uh, understanding um, and and probably uh, whether um, a good portion of their um, population um, is um, uh, older persons or not. Um, so, uh, if a country is very young with a young population and still don't have this uh, problem uh, that uh, older persons face, um, then maybe there is less awareness, social awareness among the general public or the policymakers uh, and uh, state as a uh, as a whole. Uh, and then, if um, uh, the country has more um, sizable portion, proportion of population as uh, elderly, then maybe there is somewhat more understanding. So, so I think rather than developed or developing, um, uh, uh, I think it depends on the more demographic uh, composition and then social understanding. Um, that's how I see it. But still, you know, um, uh, there might be some countries that has uh, more um, uh, awareness on, on the rights of um, older persons or the issues that involves older persons, I should it, say. It, it, of course, uh, the demographics of a nation um, will uh, indeed impact this thing and the awareness that they have. Uh, thank you, Madame Shin. Excellent comments as always. If I may go back to Mr. Quartero, uh, we receive another question, uh, if I may. Um, basically on technology, Mr. Quartero, um, it says uh, all the persons uh, manifest having uh, challenges uh, when using technology, uh, particularly online banking, uh, applications or processes, and they uh, manifest as well their frustration. Um, they prefer perhaps to receive a, a service from a person that they can speak to. Uh, can you please give us some comments? on how the financial sector is recognizing this need, please. Yeah, as I said uh, in, my, in my speech, uh, in my turn, uh, um, this, this is what is happening. This is, this is what is happening uh, at the current time. No? Uh, the technology is going very fast uh, and uh, uh, the, the, old, the, the, older, the older people um, are not being able to go so fast. Uh, what uh, we are doing is uh, giving, uh, preparing some sessions with our senior clients and teach them how they can adapt 
a bit more rapidly to to the change because the change is coming and nobody is going to change to stop that change no and we, we, we when we end up the sessions people who weren't able to uh, interact with the bank through the app they end up interacting uh, through the app with the bank but in in any case we have prepared a, a set of uh, actions just uh, because we know that people, uh, our, our elders, are, are used to receive personal uh, personal service. That is what it has happened always in the past. And this is our aim also, to give personal service to, to our clients. That is why we, we don't, uh, in, in, the, in the special line that we have created, there are no bots uh, permitted. So it, it is a person, uh, the one who attends to, 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 to another person, not to our client. Uh, obviously, we use the WhatsApp just to have a connection. Sometimes it's not necessary to talk, but you need to know that it's not about the one who is uh, answering. No, uh, as I said, the training sessions are very important, uh, uh, but uh, we 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 made we have to make an effort from the bank, but uh, we we require that the the clients also make an effort because if not. Not only they will uh, they won't they won't adapt to the banks, no, they won't adapt to, to life because uh, you know that before uh, ten years ago nobody was buying by, uh, via internet and uh, now eighty percent of the population uh, buy more through in, via internet than personally, no. So this is a change which uh, won't go back and uh, we have to adapt and uh, we have to help our elder people to to adapt as soon as possible. Uh, thank you very much. I, I couldn't agree more. And um, just the, the last set of questions, um, uh, because we have received uh, more than 20 so questions, but uh, for all of you, we are participants that are uh, still with us, more than 80 participants, uh, I believe from more than 20 countries. Uh, thank you for that. And also, uh, as usual, UNITAR will put the proceedings, um, the recordings of this um, uh, webinar or, online on YouTube for our website. And there are several other hundreds of people that listen. So to all of them, our appreciation for, for validating our efforts um, with the willingness to hear. Um, uh, we remember that this uh, webinar is entitled Voices from the Ground, Advocacy and Action for Protection and Participation of Older Persons. And we are very privileged uh, listening from uh, very senior uh, speakers and uh, thought leaders on both sides uh, from the point of view of advocacy of the international organizations, um, uh, awareness raising, uh, particularly on the instruments of the human rights ecosystem, as we call it, but at the same time, uh, or listening from a practical example, in this case, from the financial sector, from a senior uh, leader within the Caixa Bank in Spain, on what is it that uh, one particular financial institution is actually making to improve the lives of older person. Uh, uh, what actions are being taken. So with that, uh, let me go to the last uh, uh, question uh, out of many, uh, and this goes to Madame Shin. It says, uh, it is really nice to hear about the concept of monitoring the rights of older persons by groups of older persons themselves. I would like to know more about this innovative possibility and if it would be possible to include this in a potential new global treaty. So older persons actually, uh, as stakeholders, monitoring what happens. Madam Shi. Um, uh, it was an attempt by the Korean National Human Rights Commission, uh, which lasted from 2009, as I exp uh, explained, uh, until 2016, I believe. Um, the Korean National Human Rights Commission has uh, now um, six offices across the nation. So in Busan, Daegu, Daejeon, you know, the East Coast area. So uh, through uh, these um, different regional offices, um, they um, uh, recruited uh, those who are willing to be engaged with um, the training um, about the uh, human rights of older persons and then to look for uh, cases around them uh, and then to report 
uh, so it is monitoring um, uh, by um, those who are over 65 um, and then find out the um, incidents and then um, the uh, fact they can also be engaged in uh, um, uh, interviewing their friends or neighbors um, so that the facts are collected. Um, so um, that was the uh, project um, 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 invented by the uh, Korean National Human Rights Commission, which lasted several years. Um, and then I guess um, uh, uh, it was, uh, it continued and then uh, maybe uh, because th those people who um, was chosen, uh, trained and chosen as uh, human rights defenders for all the persons, uh, they wanted to continue. So, so there was no real uh, change of people. And I think maybe that's why it didn't continue uh, uh, permanently. Uh, but anyway, um, it gave a very, uh, I think, um, a good way of uh, making uh, people, especially the um, uh, older persons, to be aware of their own rights as well as um, those um, uh, older persons around them. Uh, and uh, maybe we need to um, take uh, a fresh look uh, whether we can uh, revive that kind of uh, program. Um, but anyway, that was that uh, was a project of several um, years. Uh, in, indeed, indeed, uh, and thank you again. Now um, we have received uh, quite a unique uh, question for uh, Mr. Quartero, very specific uh, from the point of view of. Uh, actions uh, being taken in this case by the financial sector and particularly by Kaisha Bank. Quite, quite interesting, it, it says, uh, can uh, you please address from the point of view of risk management, if older persons uh, should be still able to get credit at advanced, uh, advanced age, and if uh, financial institutions are ready to develop this type of new products um, uh, for, for elder people. So. Um, uh, quite an interesting question because at the same time, Mr. Quartero, we understand the responsibility of a bank. Uh, you have to assess risk and you have to decide yes or no um, uh, on the likelihood of repayment. But because the demographics, as we are discussing here, is changing rapidly and people now live well into their 90s or beyond, um, the question uh, from this person is, is the financial system ready to change um, uh, that product design portfolio? To you. It is a quite a straight uh, question, and I will give uh, a quite a straight uh, answer. Uh, yes, we are ready because, uh, as uh, we have uh, all heard, uh, life expectancy is growing, and then uh, the, uh, there are always uh, a stop uh, uh, in the age uh, where you can raise uh, money into into the bank. Uh, the risk politics of every bank are different. Uh, we have all uh, different, but uh, normally the top of the of the age uh, where you can uh, raise money uh, into a bank is seven, from 70 to 80 uh, years old. Okay, this 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 is the age up uh, at, at the at the uh, you have to stop uh, paying the, the 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 loan or the mortgage. Uh, you cannot stop uh, later than 80 years. Okay, 80 years old when you are 80 years old. But as life expectancy is growing, uh, the, the, the risk politics will have to adapt to that uh, reality. Okay, so yes, this is, uh, this is uh, growing and it has grown since I, st I started uh, uh, working in a bank. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very specific answer indeed. Um, there is a lot of curiosity. And of course, uh, one of the fundamental services that the elder uh, population, older population needs is financial services. So thank you, Mr. Quartero. Uh, the same goes to you, Madame Sheen. It's quite an honor for us to, to have an expert like you uh, willing to share uh, knowledge and opinion in these type of events. And before we go, um, Ana Lucia and Benzanur just reminded me of um, uh, something that I uh, most uh, mentioned. Uh, and allow me to do it now. Uh, before closing this event, uh, by using the same channels for the previous event, we will be inviting you to the fifth 
and last event of this series. Uh, the next webinar is entitled United Nations in the Field, Empowerment and Alignment in the World to Strengthen the Protection and Participation of Older Persons. Uh, to the participants, if you register once in one of the events of the series, there is no need to register again. Again, you will be receiving kind reminders by Unitar, and we hope that you can join us again. And also, and in the same manner as we did for the previous events, uh, we will be sharing the takeaways on this event uh, via social media and on our website. And those who join us today will be receiving information to access uh, to the certificate of participation issued by Unitar if they would like to have a certificate in that sense. And with this, Thank you very much uh, to all our speakers and to all of you participants for joining us today. We are always delighted and Unitar to have these type of conversations uh, with illustrious persons like Madame Shin and Mr. Quartero and the other ones that have participated by a video because it enriches us and it enriches the discussion on how is it that this world of ours is uh, getting uh, prepared to deal with the new demographics, which is a reality today. All the persons will continue to grow and grow as a percentage of the total population. On behalf of UNITAR and all of the other UN agencies and entities that are part of this effort, I thank you very much for your participation today. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.